All right, thanks for the invitation, and it's a great pleasure to uh, give a, like, like a detailed talk um, in this program. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about, um, OK, so let me maybe first um, give you a list of uh, what I intend to talk. Um, so first, I'll start with uh, uh, motivation. Um, and in particular, I, I'll, I'll introduce the um, question we want to study today, namely the um, comparison theorem proposed by Gourmet. OK, and, and uh, um, from this question, we're going to see um, a um, bunch of related questions. And in particular, I, I'm going to talk about um, the so-called L-infinity metrics, uh, namely metrics with pretty low regularity as a um, limits of um, positive scalar curvature metrics, um, let's say smooth metrics. And and then um, I'll proceed to discuss a um, rigidity phenomenon. Um, rigidity in the um, in convex geometry, and uh, why scalar curvature naturally appears there. All right. So um, the, um, to motivate the study, I um, um, let's uh, review a little bit of Romanian geometry, namely um, the um, um, metric geometry, mm -hmm. the intended study of metric geometry um, of uh, scalar curvature. So um, let's first review the um, classical result of Alexandrov um, in 1951. Um, who defined basically what it means for sectional curvature bounded from a below a constant k um, in metric spaces. And the way he did it is um, by considering um, geodesic triangles in this Riemannian manifold, M, N, and G. And uh, um, a geodesic triangle of the same side length in this uh, space form of constant curvature k. Um, then the sectional curvature bigger than or equal to k means that for any choice of such geodesic triangle and any choice of um, a point q um, on, on one edge, you take the same, um, well, take the corresponding point um, bisecting into the same ratio. Then the uh, distance measured in g of p and q is always at least the distance measured in G0 of P prime and Q prime. Right, then um, um, notice that this is only, so, so this only involves the um, notion of distance. Um, then um, um, Alexandrov defined the so-called Alexandrov spaces today. Um, namely, um, it's a metric space. Um, with this kind of triangle comparison property. And um, we call such metric spaces um, have to have sectional curvature bounded from below by k. All right, and, and uh, moreover, in this comparison theorem, um, moreover, rigidity holds. Um, rigidity holds, namely, um, if you have, if for any such um, choice of triangle and any choice of this q and q prime, you have equality, then um, this, the, the, the uh, metric G is ac actually isometric. To uh, the space form, it's metric G, G naught. Okay, and uh, um, then um, similar efforts has been put into defining what it means for, for instance, a Ricci curvature bound from below, um, for instance, Ricci non-negative, um, by by um, you know uh, some very hard um, theory in optimal transport, say so Lot Villani, and independent of S term. Um, and this is totally different from the um, geometry of Alexandrov spaces and um, quite different from what I'm, I'm interested in today. So um, I'll just uh, skip that. All right, so, so then the um, question um, we uh, sort of um, at least partially answer today is for scalar curvature. 
Um, so can we can we define um, weak notions of scalar curvature um, on spaces or metrics with um, pretty low regularity assumptions? Okay, so this is the question we want to settle. All right, so then on the uh, um, so, um, for instance, we want this weak notion to be actually equivalent to scalar curvature non-negative on, um, say, at least the C2 matrix. Okay. So um, let's discuss the first uh, brilliant observation of Gormov. Um, Gormov observed the following fact. Um, he didn't give, um, I think he didn't give a very rigorous and detailed proof, but he claimed the following to be true. Suppose you have a three-dimensional manifold, which is a um, three-dimensional cube. By that, I just don't mean M is a region enclosed by six hypersurfaces, open hypersurfaces and transverse, you know, transversely intersecting each other when they do. And uh, I don't require anything like, I, I don't require the hypersurfaces are totally geodesic, nor the, the edges are geodesic whatsoever. So it's just a combinatorial cube. Okay. Um, then, um, then the following three things cannot happen simultaneously. The first is that the uh, scalar curvature um, of, of this metric is positive in the interior. And the second um, condition is that the um, phases um, of M, so the phase of the cube, are, uh, let's say, strictly mean convex. Okay, and the third condition is that everywhere the dihedral angle. Um, the hydro angles of M are everywhere less than pi over 2. OK, so he claimed that these three conditions cannot happen at the same time. All right. and, uh, um, and why this is good for defining um, the weak notion of scalar curvature? Well, um, one noticed that the second and third condition actually uh, can make sense, you know, can be. Um, can, can make sense when the metric G is only C0. For instance, uh, when G is C0, so, um, okay, let's see, the phase is, let, let, let's call phase F is um, strictly mean convex. Mean convex. Um, this can be implied by the fact that F is locally uh, one sided area minimizing. Right, so for, for any one side deformation of this surface F, um, um, F's area is less than the area of this deformation. Right. So um, in other words, if you have this um, notion of area, you can sort of define what it, what it means for um, a surface is um, strictly mean convex. Okay, and, and of course, this uh, dihedral angle, dihedral angles can be measured by Um, measured by the metric itself without taking any derivative. Okay. So um, then these two conditions um, sort of make sense for C0 metrics. So then um, the, the goal is to, to um, define, define um, um, scalar curvature strictly, or let's say, um, if I formulate it in this condition, then it's weak, you know, non-negative, scalar curvature non-negative on C0 metrics. Okay. So if this, um, if this, this, uh, this result um, holds, then, um, then we can do this definition. All right, so um, let's, um, let's try to see um, Gormov's um, intuition why this cube statement should be true. Okay, so uh, strategy. Um, 
he argued by contradiction. Suppose we do have such a cube with uh, all the three conditions satisfied. All right. Um, then what we do is that we can make a doubling of this cube um, through the right surface, right face. Okay. So just take a take a take the topological doubling and extend the metric um, even, right? As evenly. Okay. So we, we do this doubling right here. Okay. Then um, um, after after this first time st first doubling. Um, you see, we're destroying the regularity of the metric along this common phase. Right? It's, it's not a smooth metric anymore. But the advantage we get is that now the left phase and the right phase are isometric. And we, we can do a second time doubling. So double this whole thing after the first time as a whole through the bottom phase. Okay, so once again, what we do is we just take the topological doubling and extend the metric evenly, and and then we um, we take we we take this um, bigger cube and make a third doubling across, for instance, the back face. Okay, so um, let's call this um, manifold M, M cubed, and now um, despite that we uh, we introduce lots of singularities in this doubling. Uh, we get the, we do get one condition that the opposite faces of M cubed are isometric. Right? So then we can um, you know identify the isometric opposite faces to a torus equipped with a singular metric G cubed. All right. So then um, the question is, can we desingularize this singular metric G cubed such that, um, f for instance, if we want a contradiction such that on, on this Torus, we three-dimensional torus. We have a metric with positive scalar curvature, right? And um, indeed, that's almost true. I, I mean, um, that's true ever, everywhere when G two is um, positive. Right? So, uh, sorry, sorry, when G two is regular. Um. Okay. Um, and uh, we do know a bit of the singularity structures of G-tude. Let's denote the singular set by S. The singular set then is a um, stratified set. It has a two-dimensional strata along these faces, it's denoted by F2, and the one-dimensional strata along the edges, and the zero-dimensional strata um, isolated points. Okay, and uh, um, uh, we, we have some geometric conditions um, based on those assumptions. So first of all, we know that G tilde um, um, has a um, sort of a positive jump of mean curvature along this two-dimensional strata. Okay, so I, I'll explain this condition later. Namely, uh, roughly speaking, you can. You can just look at the picture. Uh, the fact that the faces of the original cube are mean convex means that the mean curvature vectors are pointing inward, right, on, on, on the interior of each face. Then you do this even doubling. Um, then you know you look at one point in, in one interface. Then its mean curvature vectors are pointing inwards from both sides. Okay, so we call such um, such behavior the positive jump of the mean curvature. And uh, um, the, the second condition is that um, so we. Let's look at what happens near an, an edge. So this is an edge. Then originally, the um, dihedral angle of the cube along this edge is less than pi over 2. So this is less than pi over 2. Then if you, um, if you take two doublings, then, um, then what we get is sort of a conical metric along this edge. Right? So this kind of uh, metrics are, I think, previously um, studied by um, algebraic geometers. And they call it edge metrics. So um, let's say G cubed is a sort of edge matrix, edge column metric along um, this E1 with a column angle ever less than 2 pi. Okay, so that's a key condition. And um, we don't have any uh, geometric control on the vertices, the, um, the, namely this V0. but at least we know that um, you know we're not introducing any um, delta functions or so, and, and as a result, G two is locally um, you know bounded measurable. 
um, um, near this v0. Okay, so um, I'll make precise definitions to all the conditions in, in, in a minute. Okay, so um, so we sort of want to study this kind of. Um, um, oh, um, I should also mention that. It, it is kind of quite clear that uh, along this uh, two-dimensional strata and one-dimensional strata, the metric is also locally bounded measurable. Right? So um, that's why we want to um, consider the uh, question I listed over there. Namely, um, uh, we want to um, investigate, investigate the question. Um, the, um, so what kind of singular behavior Um, of a locally bounded measurable metric, let's denote by L infinity metrics, um, tend to imply that the scalar curvature is positive uh, weakly. Okay, so that's the uh, question motivated by this um, Gormov's construction. Okay, so. Um, I'll, I'll briefly review what is known um, to this question. Sorry, uh, yeah. I just got a little bit confused. So you didn't quite finish the heuristics on this case, right? Uh, well, okay. So let's see. If if I claim that this all the three conditions are we, you know, in, in some sense weakly increase the scalar curvature, then we arrive at a contradiction, right? Because then uh, I'm claiming that we can get a metric, smooth metric on the three torus with positive scalar curvature. Right, but you need a smooth, I mean, yeah, right, right. a smooth approximation. That, that's true, yeah. So um, here, uh, RG bigger than zero weakly can be understood, for instance, as um, it has a smooth approximation of positive scalar curvature metrics. Okay. And that is actually the case for most of the, per you know, for most part. Uh, all right, so um, let's discuss a little bit uh, of what's known. So is it clear what happens if you try that Ricci flow or something? Um, on, on try Ricci flow on this, um, on the on the Suri torus. Um, you know, I am not an expert on Ricci flow. So f this kind of condition has been treated by Ricci flow. And uh, this edge column matrix Ricci flow, I, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe somebody, someone in the audience can give me the answer. For instance, I know, um, I think um, Rafe Mazil and, uh, um, um, and his collaborators are working on a notion of Ricci flow from edge column metrics. Yeah. So, so I, don't, I don't know whether it's known. And, and also, this, if you have a three-dimensional, so, so in a general dimensional which flow with just bounded measurable initial data, I, I don't think it's, you can actually flow it. OK, so um, all right, so um, let's discuss the uh, singular behavior of um, L infinity metrics. All right, so the first case is, um, let's look at the simplest case. The best, best understood case is when um, the singular set S is actually a co-dimension one, um, let's say smooth embedded, um, embedded and uh, two-sided <coughs> hypersurface. Okay, so um, when the singular set is a smooth topological um, sum manifold um, of co dimension one, then we have to um, follow a theorem. But be before stating the theorem, let me uh, illustrate the um, observation by a simple example. Uh, what you can do, imagine, is that you can take a spherical cap in, in just in 2D, and uh, um, such that the spherical cap is contained in the um, you know, hemisphere, 
then you can ref you can reflect it across the boundary, right? Then um, then by basic Gauss Bonnet. Um, uh, you will see that this um, along this curve gamma, this um, Gauss curvature um, is uh, behaves sort of a an, it's a direct delta function um, if the um, geodesic curvature gamma in in both parts are positive. Okay, so that's that's the uh, basic observation, and um, this is an, in fact true in a. Um, in more general scenario, so um, if you take, okay, I think that okay, this theorem was first stated in the version of the positive mass theorem by Penzimiel in 2002. Um, it is um, he did not state the theorem in, in for closed manifolds, but the same same method argument just work. So um, if you have a um, some manifold sigma minus one containing the Monument manifold, it, which is two sided and closed. And G, we assume it's infinity um, from both sides to sigma. Okay, so um, this is our hypersurface sigma, and G is smooth from um, uh, when, you, when you approach the sigma from both sides. Okay, and assume the mean curvature, um, the mean curvature um, of uh, on sigma. We view g as you know we we view g as the boundary. So our sigma is the boundary of this um, you know local two pieces. Uh, you assume these two mean curvatures sum up to some non-negative number. Okay, so um, this condition is actually what it means by positive jump of mean curvature over there. Then. There exists a family of metrics G K, which are smooth metrics, such that G K converge in um, infinity lock to G away from the singular set, and R of G K is bigger than or equal to R of G um, everywhere. Uh, everywhere on um, um, minus sigma. Um, okay, so in a way, um, this um, if you think about this statement, then um, a metric G having such co-dimension one singularity sort of means that the scalar curvature long sigma is positive. You know, it w will tend to increase, right? So that's. Um, and, and that's a cor corollary. If, in particular, the original metric is assumed to be non-negative on m minus sigma, then r of g k is non-negative everywhere. <coughs> okay, and uh, um, this is the. Um, Original statement of um, Penzimiel, and in fact, there are more than one proof to this uh, to this fact. Wait, um, we G K also converges to G C zero globally, right? Oh yeah, right. Because in this case, actually, G is uh, if if we assume this, then G is C zero, right? Then then it's globally in C is convergence in C zero, right? Um, also in C zero often. Okay, and uh, um, there are. Um, let me briefly mention that there are at least um, three approaches to this um, to this fact or, or its application. So first is the original um, approach by Penzimel, which is a conformal um, so conformal method, um, and uh, with the uh, what we call arbitrarily. By approximation, okay. And uh, um, what I really mean by that is that 
you know, basically, um, we can first construct G, um, G epsilon for a very small epsilon, where um, G epsilon is very close to G, um, close to G in C0. It may not uh, have positive scalar curvature everywhere, or, you know, it may not increase scalar curvature everywhere, but then we take a conformal change of metric. Um, then, then basically we can, you know, through this conformal change of metric, we can um, obtain this GK. Okay, so we're going to talk about this um, method later in detail. And second, if the um, if we know the um, singular set is co-dimension one, then Ricci flow does work. So. Um, And uh, a third method is um, when you are dealing with three manifolds or in general spin manifold, you can also use spinners to um, work out, uh, you know, um, I think not directly for this theorem because it's, you know, spinners cannot construct metrics, but for its applications, for instance, on um, positive mass theorem, um, you can use spinners uh, to prove it. It's, it's done by, um, then Lee and Lafrog, I think. <coughs> okay, so um, this is the um, case of case of co-dimension one singular set. So um, let's move on to uh, co-dimension two. Um, and uh, let's also assume that S is just a um, co-dimension two embedded submanifold. Sorry, yes. Yeah. It's just Gauss Bonnet, right? But can you yeah. can you make it regular like the smoothing two dimension if you, if you double twice the square? Um, then you just have point singularities. I think so. Yes, in, in, in dimension two, I think it works. In dimension two, that yeah, yeah, it's it's a rigorous argument. I think, yeah. In in gen in three dimensions, what we can do is that we can allow you know this um, this skeleton singularities, namely we have a few curves joined joined by you know, isolated points. So so in general, we can deal with such pictures. <coughs> I, I think the same method will, will work for, for for such configuration in code in, the, in, sur in surfaces like dimension two. Okay. All right. So um, okay. So a natural condition. So once again, without put any geometric condition, you cannot expect such uh, you know um, such such a. a such result to be true, namely there, there can be L infinity matrix singular at uh, co-dimension two embedded some manifolds, which actually decrease scalar curvature. Okay, so, uh, so a natural geometric condition is the following. Geometric condition. Um, okay, so let's once again uh, look at the example illustrated by gauss bonnet Now uh, we can take a, um, um, Riemann surface M, and uh, along it we take some isolated points. Okay, and uh, we assume PJ um, is isolated conical singularities um, of cone angle. Um, two pi times beta i, sorry, beta j plus one. Okay, so then the um, Gauss Bonnet says that if you uh, integrate the Gauss curvature on sigma minus this um, this points, um, and then plus sorry minus two pi times sigma um, the, the sum of one to k of minus sorry beta just beta j, then it's two pi times the roller characteristic. Okay, na namely the Gauss curvature sort of behave like um, um, minus beta j direct delta 
on, on these um, conical singularities. And as a corollary, we see that when beta j is uh, less than 0, uh, or um, in other words, the uh, cone angle is uh, less than um, 2 pi, the, um, the Gauss curvature will be positive. So we can, um, and, and there's a very nice geometric observation which we're going to use later. But um, so if you consider a cone like this, um, then what we can do is that, uh, okay, so, so why is the Gauss curvature here positive? Well, what we can do is that we can, you know, um, chop it off, truncate it by a small disk. Right? And get another cone, and you, if you take the small parameter um, in the truncation, then this curve gamma um, is a co-dimension one curve, but it actually satisfies that condition in co-dimension one. So if cone angle is less than two pi, then um, along this gamma, we do have that positive jump of mean curvature. Okay, so um, that's that's another way of um, you know viewing at conical singularities. You mean if you make it a flat disk? Yeah, just to yeah. just put in a flat disk. Okay, so um, I'm going to write a rigorous definition of um, the edge cone matrix we're going to consider. So um, in complex geometry, there's there's a um, definition of edge cone, but we don't have complex structure. So we uh, take the uh, definition from a paper by Atia and LeBron. Um, OK, so they um, studied the effect of edge cone matrix on four manifolds. And, and you, I think we, one can generally do the definition in all dimensions. So you take a um, you medicine manifold. Um, then we call G is an edge column metric. Along N, if um, the following is true, namely um, you can use a you, you know use the polar coordinates around N to write locally that G is dr square plus um, beta plus one square. Um, R square d theta times sigma square <coughs> plus omega plus um, R to one plus eta h. So it's kind of a uh, you know um, it's not a simple formula, but l let me just quickly convince you that th this is indeed the case. So here uh, we assume the following. Um, so first, so we take a local coordinate x one x two y1 to yn minus 2. Um, and this r theta is the polar coordinates of x1, x2 plane. So r e to square root minus 1 theta is x1 plus root 1 root minus 1 x2. OK, and uh, this uh, y1 to yn, so sorry, y, y1 to y n minus 2, I'm sorry, is the uh, local coordinate On n. Okay, and and beta is the angle function. So when beta is zero, it corresponds to um, angle two pi. So beta is from, and, and we want the angle to be positive at least. So it's a uh, function. Uh, I'm sorry. So so yeah, the, the angle in general should be two pi times beta plus one, right? So we um, require beta is a function from minus one to infinity. And, and is, um, is C2, right? And uh, what are other things? Well, the sigma means that you know it's not a, so it's in general the normal and, and the um, base direction might not be strictly orthogonal. So theta, uh, you know, theta is an arbitrary C C2 one form on n, and omega is the metric on 
uh, end itself, right? So, so let's see, omega is C2 metric. And, and, and H here is, means that, H here also means a, a sort of tilting be, between this uh, normal and base direction. So H is um, C2, um, let's see, uh, symmetric to tensor. Um, on the manifold on M. Okay. And uh, for technical reason, require that this um, factor eta here is bigger than 2 minus 4 over N, which is a very mild um, restriction if you think about it. And if you if you take a normal coordinate, you expect eta to be 2, actually. So. Okay, so um, it's a definition of the edge call matrix we consider. All right. Um, so let me first state a um, theorem um, in the flavor of uh, Penzi Mills theorem. So it's a theorem um, joined with uh, crystals. Where is beta defined? Yeah, C2 on N. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, the theorem says the following. Um, let M M, M be, a, uh, be a Mabi, um, a Mabi non-positive. Think of a torus manifold, okay. and G is a metric such that um, such that the first is that G is smooth. Um, G is a bounded measurable metric, and it's a C two lock away from a co-dimension two. So manifold S. So S is a co-dimension two submanifold, and the G is edge cone. It's an let's say a ma edge metric on S, um, such that the cone angles are less than or equal to two pi everywhere. Okay. So the, the second is that the scalar curvature of G is non-negative. On and minus s, then um, then the um, observation is that um, this condition basically means the scalar curvature is increasing. You know, it, it's increased on s, and it's non-negative elsewhere. And the original manifold we assume to be a Mabi non-positive. So then the conclusion is um, G extends smoothly. a Ricci flat metric on the whole manifold M. Okay. Um, and uh, um, if I, I can also, you know, um, let me write a remark. Um, in fact, we, we can also uh, write the statement in, in the format of, of uh, that theorem over there. So in fact, um, there exists a sequence of metrics GK such that GK converge to G um, in C2 log of M minus S um, and uh, also in the space of bounded measurable metrics. Right, right. Uh, l l let me first finish this uh, statement here. Yeah. And, and R of GK is positive. Okay, so so, um, so let me so l let me uh, try to convince you that it is actually rich. So the first statement you would guess is that it's a scalar flat metric, right? But it's actually rich flat um, because of the fact that um, the the M N is a Yamabe non-positive, 
right? Um, so it's, it's, it corresponds to this rigidity statement of, um, so um, there's a theorem of, um, of Rick um, says that if, um, so, so basically, or l l let me just, uh, you know, uh, describe the theorem in words. So all the manifolds can be classified into one of the three classes. The first is that they might be positive, namely the support symmetric positive scalar curvature. The second is yeah, might be um, zero. Um, in this case, if you're, you have a, me a metric with um, a non-negative scalar curvature, then it, uh, it is automatically rich or flat. Because if it's not rich or flat, then you can locally deform the metric in the, um, so you can run rich flow, for instance, to strictly increase the scalar curvature. And the third is it might be negative, the third class. Okay. All right, so let me. OK, any, any other questions? So GK is supposed to be similar there? Uh, GK is smooth. Um, GK is C2 themselves. Um. So, but I'm confused on the curvature condition there, right? Uh, which curve? I mean, yeah. The RGK strictly positive at the very end of the board. Yeah. Uh, let's say non-negative. Yeah, and it's actually strict if um, anywhere the angle is strictly less than two pi. It is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so th that's why I write it uh, as a remark. So uh, in the proof, we, we construct a s such a sequence GK satisfying this condition to conclude that the original metric has to be rich. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the con as part of the conclusion, G is now singular. Okay. What is the dimension N? Three? Um, at least a three, let's say. OK, so um, I hope I convince you that this is the correct picture in co-dimension 2. And uh, let's. Um, How do you find the the, the cube picture? Uh, right, that's the, that's the um, goal, I think. OK, so um, remember, we have co-dimension 3, right? Let's say S is uh, co-dimension bigger than or equal to 3 in general. OK, so um, there is a conjecture um, by Rick. It says the following. So suppose G is an infinity uh, metric, bounded measurable the manifold M, and uh, it's uh, smooth with scalar curvature non-negative. Um, the um, on M minus S with co-dimension as at least three. Then there exists this family GK. Sequence GK that GK are smooth metrics, um, and GK converge to G in um, this infinity lock um, and minus S. Oh well, this may not be true anymore. Yeah, so just it's a infinity lock in, in minus S, and with R of GK, non negative. So this is unconditional now, right? It's, uh, it's unconditioned. There's no geometric condition. Two theorems, you know? Yeah. So when, when the co dimension of a singular set is at least the three, uh, Rick believed that there, is no, there should be no geometric condition um, on the set S to, to, uh, for you to, you know, it basically it says that the set S is, does not affect scalar curvature at all. So when it's of higher co-dimension. 
Okay, so um, let me uh, state uh, evidence that that might be true. So it's a theorem on um, twist crystals. Okay, so um, basically it is true when S is isolated points contained in the three manifold and and, and the three. I think and any code dimension three. Um, Sorry. Yeah, let's say any code dimension three sense. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that's the um, result we know. All right. Um, let me. Uh, let me mention the fact that I, um, I, I very recently found out, which is also, um, which could be interesting. So, um, the proof of all the theorems I mentioned, um, the um, including Penzimel theorem and this co-dimension two theorem, and that theorem, um, are all constructive in nature. So basically, we can argue that there is a sequence of metric G K which approach G in in a pretty strong sense. Right, and, and as, as a desingularization, okay. So then uh, the uh, um, desingularization of the sequence of GK um, um, uh, satisfies, you know, the, the, the okay. So this um, is such that uh, this GK converge in G converges to G. Okay, so it's not in C0 because the G is not. Right? In that case, it's an only on infinity. But it's actually in uh, uh, the uh, intrinsic flat distance. Okay, in, in other words, and, and, and this is a pretty non trivial fact. Just in the last case or in? In, in all, the, all, all the cases, the convergence in the intrinsic flat distance. And uh, it's, it follows. Um, from a theorem of Luxian and uh, Sermani. You correct me if I, if I were wrong. Okay. So I, I think this is true. Right. Okay, so, so in particular, these singular metrics are, uh, you know, a large non trivial field of examples of um, how positive scalar curvature can degenerate in. The intrinsic flat convergence. All right. So, um, let's see what's the time. Okay, maybe I'll talk about some proofs and uh, we'll take a rest. Um, all right. So let's mention a little bit of um, how one construct is. Um, Family of matrix GK. All right, so um, proof of the uh, co dimension two case. All right, so let's. Um, perhaps I already. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I didn't. So. So the metric look look like this, right? So we're going to desingularize this metric. So it's 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 a pretty um, it's a pretty messy metric. So uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to calculate the scalar curvature um, of a metric of the. Um, maybe I'll move it. We're going to calculate the scalar curvature of a metric in this form, namely G tooth is um, F tooth square, I'm sorry, F squared dr square, where F is a function depending on R and theta. All right, so, uh, and and uh, plus R square d theta plus sigma square plus omega tooth. Okay, so you, you throw in everything there into a, into a um, generally speaking, um, Let's just call it a metric omega. All right, so let's calculate the scalar curvature of this metric. 
then the, the important lemma, well, well, let me write it as a proposition, is the scalar curvature of G2 satisfies the following thing, namely um, um, R2 2 minus eta, it's a small factor, times the scalar curvature minus twice R inverse F minus 3 drf is less than or equal to some constant. Okay, so basically this proposition says that the singular part is dominant by this, uh, this <coughs> behavior f. Okay. And, uh, and, and eta. What does this tilde come Yeah, so just look at this expression, right? I am throwing everything here into the tilde. Or, and, and, and that eta there is, um, is, in, is, 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 is o also appears here. All right, so the, as you can imagine, it's the, the, there are quite a, quite a long computation of the scalar curvature, but. I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Does this F square, the coefficient of dr square, or the coefficient of d theta plus theta? No, it's, it's uh, the, the coefficient. What happens to theta? Yeah, beta. beta. Yeah, in in reality, what we are going to, so so in reality, f is uh, like one over beta, plus one square. So this is for notation simplicity. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, what, what's it? okay. Um, right, so um, in that case, I think I, I need to allow f to depend on also on, on y as well. So yeah, so it's as function r and theta and y. Okay, and how do we do the calculation? Well, the technique, which I'll very, very briefly describing, um, is the slicing technique. So. Uh, what we do is we slice the um, a tubular neighborhood of n. Let's say u is a tubular neighborhood. Of n, then uh, we slice it by the distance function r. So r denote n r as r equals to constant. And u. OK, so then uh, what we do is that we use the uh, um, Gauss equation on um, nr and the Jacobi equation also on nr. So if you use these equations, then after cancellation, you will get something like r of g cubed. It's going to be r of g cubed restricted on nr minus 2f inverse dr of the mean curvature of surface nr minus 2f inverse Laplacian f. This is on nr as well, that Laplacian, minus h nr squared minus h squared. OK, so we, you will, you know, staring at this. And, and, and then we can explicitly calculate what is HR and NR. It's in, in some calculation. And so in particular, these terms are all uh, bounded. These are not singular terms. <coughs> and uh, we want to argue this is a singular term. So we, we need to calculate this again. So um, the scalar curvature of the restriction, restriction of the metric on NR again. Um, so what we, in, in reality, what we did is to use another slicing. So we, and n of r theta defined to be um, theta equals to constant intersecting n r, and and use the same trick again. So, um, and then after these two slicings, the the, the scalar curvature um, um, can be expressed, you know, sort of easily, and, and you can see this is the only singular term.
Okay, and uh, let me draw a picture to convince you further. This is exactly what we're doing in truncating this um, this um, column in two dimension. Okay. So, so, so this is our n r. Okay. All right. So. Um, so which term is the partial rf? Um, Let's see. Um, I think, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the, uh, I, I, I think I said something wrong. I think this is the DRF term. It will be encoded here. Okay. All right. Um, so then um, we can take f to be a function like this. Uh, let me draw, just draw, draw a graph. So as I said, you should imagine f as 1 over beta plus 1 squared. So f is a cutoff function from 0 to epsilon, which starts as 1 and as an ends at 1 over beta plus 1 squared. Okay. And uh, you will see that uh, when beta is less than 0, namely the cone angle is less than 2 pi, this function, we can make it monotone increasing, which means the scalar curvature is a pretty big. Sorry, what is the, the variable you are plotting there? Is it the distance from the vertex? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this, is the, this is r vector. F sub epsilon, exactly, yeah, right, right. Okay, so um, it's, it's a bit technical and, um, but okay, sh shall we take a break? It's one hour now. Why not? Yeah, um, Christina uh, gave me a very good suggestion um, to clear uh, some confusion. So uh, the, the famous uh, rigidity theorem of Rick um, is the following thing. So if um, uh, you have a Yamabe non-positive manifold and uh, you have a metric with non-negative scalar curvature, then G is rigid flat. OK, so that's uh, uh, that, that should. Uh, should, should make more sense. Now the theorem looks, um, you know, so make more sense. Metric. So it's for s smooth metrics, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. No, 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 it's just smooth metric, yeah. Okay, so um, that's the, um, that's the, um, oh, all right, so let me just make, um, maybe uh, add one, 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 two more sentences on, on this result. So uh, what we do is that we replace f by this f epsilon. And by this fact, we see there's a huge amount of positive scalar curvature you know, condensing along this uh, co-dimension 2 submanifolds. There might be some negative scalar curvature elsewhere, but then we do a conformal change of metric. Um, and the uh, fact, um, and, and we can uh, do so uh, when s epsilon goes to 0, the, the, uh, the uh, metric, um, the, after the conformal change, the metric converts back to the original metric. And the conformal change makes the sc scalar curvature everywhere positive. I think that the rest is uh, like a pretty common mis co common um, technique in the in the field. Sorry, so is f epsilon radial? F epsilon is a uh, radial function. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So <coughs> let me uh, mention. Um, very quickly, how we do the co-dimension three so case. The original, the original f was not a real function, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah, right. So, it, yeah. So, right. So, so in, in reality, we basically just truncate f, truncate the uh, f, and then by a constant function. Yeah, it's radio in the neighborhood, right? All right. So let me. Uh, is this? Okay, so um, proof of uh, uh, 
of um, called dimension three Ethereum. Um, so the proof um, in, in this proof we also construct that sequence of G epsilon, but from a pretty different, uh, but from a pretty different uh, way. So um, the the way is a, a sort of a um, surgery process by Shen Yao or Mao Lawson. So wh what we do, imagine we have a um, sorry manifold with uh, isolated point singularity. What we do is that we first blow up the metric. Um, by Green's function of conformal Laplacian. And second, we cut out a large asymptotic region. So cut the asymptotic Euclidean asymptotically. Median region um, along a minimal surface. And third, we can fill in the hole um, uh, with um, positive scalar curvature metrics. Okay, so um, in, in, in the picture, what will happen is that uh, you have an isolated point singularity um, with an L infinity metric. Then you uh, use a conformal Laplacian's Green function, Green's function with with, the, with a direct delta here to blow up the metric. Uh, what you'll get is okay. So everywhere else was just a slightly wiggled, but but this point uh, are sent, is sent to infinity. Then um, we find a uh, min we argue that there there is an error minimizing surface here. In, in this um, in this asymptotically Euclidean neck, and we just cut it off. So, and then we fill in a um, a, um, a hemisphere to uh, make it a smooth and uh, a smooth metric is positive scalar curvature. Mm -hmm. So, in doing so, we're not changing the topology of the manifold, the original manifold, and we can. Uh, we can make the whole process very, you know, very close to this uh, in, in, in the arbitrarily small neighborhood of this um, point singularity. Uh, in the last step, do you stay within smooth matrix, let's say infinity, or it's a it's a bit tricky. So um, what? Well, I like tricky questions. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's like an answer. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> um, so this step is by Crystal's um, thesis, I think. And w w what one really does is that you you know you, you make you, you add a spherical cap, such that <laughs> along this uh, co-dimension one surface there's a positive jump of mean curvature. Therefore, th then then you use the um, the, the old the technique other. again, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky process. So that cap could be long. Uh, no, no. It's a short. It, 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 everything happens in that small neighborhood. Okay, so um, I think I'll, I'll s skip the um, details here. Okay. Um, so this includes the space of negative Alexander of curvature. Space of negative Alexander of curvature. The opening angle of the cone is really, really large. Three yeah, yeah. If it's a conical uh, co-dimension three singularity, and uh, you Euclid, yeah. As long as it's an L infinity, it's bounded measurable. By by that, um, y yeah, I haven't given the definition of L infinity matrix. So, sorry. So by that, I just mean it's uniformly equivalent to some smooth um, Riemannian metric H. Okay. Excuse me. So where is the parameter epsilon? Um, the blow up factor. So what we do is that we take epsilon g. So. Oh, 
very likely. I, I don't know, to be honest. So, yeah. I, I think it's just you know a matter of checking this condition, whether it's true or not. Ah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, that's not, uh, that's the answer is negative. So let's see. Step one is fine. Step two is a uh, question mark because we know the minimal surface exists, but we have no control of this topology in higher dimensions. In in three dimension, it's a stable minimal surface, so automatically as two. Um, yeah, in, in higher dimensions, uh, I mean, this surface can be just like crazy, then you are changing the topology of manifold, that's for sure. And, um, and we don't know how to fill in the hole if you cut not by a, um, by a, by a sphere, but say by a torus or cylinder. But sorry, I'm a little bit confused. But you know, the point is that um, in the asymptotic region of an asymptotically flat manifold, you have a CMC foliation. Oh, so, uh, so eventually you do control the topology. Wait, wait, that's right. L l l let me be very clear. Because of this condition, we're, we're only assuming the condition on G, not on this derivative whatsoever. Therefore, the, the, uh, blow up, the blown up metric is only asymptotically Euclidean. It's not asymptotically flat. And the difference being? The, the difference means that the, uh, the blow up metric, let's call it G tilde, right? G tilde, um, See, um, so the the metric um, the metric on G two is um, say diffeomorphic to the outside of above radius one in Euclidean space. It's uh, it's only um, two sided equivalent to the Euclidean metric. Nothing okay. more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you if you can guarantee that it's asymptotically flat, then the CMC foliation will say something. Okay, so that's um, oh yeah, right. Yeah, it's another. Uh, it's it's a good question. So we we can prove a lemma. Basically, um, this if you have a okay, so if um, if uh, okay, let me write it here. Um, so let's say M minus a compact set is um, diffeomorphic to B R three minus a B one, and such that the metric satisfies this condition, then um, you can just uh, minimize you take the infimum of um, sorry infimum of the um, boundary of omega where omega contains B1 it's an open set then this infimum is achieved and it involves a, a little bit of comparison and uh, so, so basically it says that under this condition this infimum cannot you know the minimizing sequence cannot go to infinity it's contained in the uniform size ball. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the case if there's no topology on the original manifold, so the puppy that minimizes it is just um, is disappointing, right? I mean, because if the picture looks like you have a topology which tells you the minimizer cannot go to infinity. Right. How do you know that the minimizer really exists? But it must include the ball, right? Yeah. It must include the ball. She yeah. uh, uh, is prescribing uh, omega to include the Oh, yeah. So that, that avoids one side of the generation. Yeah, there's a, 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 yeah, uh, there's a little bit. Just a sphere of the ball. Well, yeah, right, right, yeah. Uh, there, there, there's another compactness argument. So you have to have the mean curvature on the ball is nice or something. No, uh, uh, there's another compact, compactness argument um, um, sh saying that as epsilon go to zero, this guy is you know, um, finally minimal. Okay, so um, there are some tricky parts here. We can grill him during the closed discussions next week. He's got an hour. If, if, you, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess the quantum means that the nearby sphere is a variable. Okay. 
Uh, I, I don't think we have any barrier at all in, in, uh, w w with this condition. If you have a C, if you have a C one control of the original metric, then probably you can argue that there's a mean convex barrier. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let me move on to the next part. Uh, you know, so if that's a yeah. theory, how do you run the regularity theory? It can be achieved by non -minimum. Uh, well, may, 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 sh shall we discuss later? I mean, it's okay. Yes. okay um, uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, I have to um, keep this this part of discussion sort of concise. Okay, so um, let's remind ourselves that all this business is to solve Gormov's original question, right? Um, so we have this understanding of, um, of um, co-dimension one and two and three singular set. Um, so, um, so let's go back to the original cube question. So um, as a matter of fact, this, um, this kind of um, desingularization result we have is not strong enough to de desingularize the co-dimension one to three um, singular set, the stratified singular set, um, simultaneously. There's some subtle regularity issue there. But um, let, let, me, let me mention one, one uh, result that I, that I just very recently heard. There's uh, this um, um, former student, um, Nucci. So um, um, he, he proposed another uh, idea in, in a doubling procedure. Um, of uh, three cube, um, which can um, essentially avoid all this mass and, and make the doubling happen in a strict case. So um, when r is big, strictly bigger than zero and h is strictly mean convex, and everywhere the hero angle is strictly less than pi over two. Okay. Um, so um, if I have time, I, I can go back to this point later. So um, the uh, the question um, brought up by doubling is then um, at least there are two more questions to think about. So the first is that uh, as the um, case of Alexandrov space, the um, Alexandrov geometry, we sort of want the comparison object to be, you know, this, for instance, a set of all triangles, right? We we're, we don't want to prescribe a combinatorial type in a polyhedron. So the first question is about uh, other type of uh, polyhedron. Um, then the uh, reflection and doubling w will not work. Right? Essentially, um, this this is only designed for cubes. Right? You cannot get a torus from a simplex. And, the, and second is the rigidity statement. We sort of want to argue that if everything is um, in non-strict inequality, um, then you want to argue it's actually flat, flat uh, Euclidean, um, let's say, uh, rectangular solid. As in the case of Alexandrov um, geometry. Okay, so um, there's another uh, viewpoint of this, uh, and turns out um, there's another viewpoint of this um, Gromov's polyhedron comparison. Um, that is, we can actually uh, view it as a variational problem and, uh, and treat it uh, in a different way. So um, before that, let me mention a, um, I think, a Classical question in the uh, in the um, uh, study of convex geometry. So the, it says the following: so Suppose um, P contained in R three is a a convex and and flat polygon or polyhedron, and uh, let P prime be another um, polygon 
OK, PP, let's say Lipschitz diffeomorphic to P. And uh, suppose uh, you have two things. The first is that each um, face of P prime is mean convex. And the second is that the dihedral angle of P prime is everywhere strictly less than the di sorry, strictly less, sorry, less than or equal to the dihedral angle of P. OK, via the Lipschitz diffeomorphism. More them, you can compare the dihedral angle along one edge to the corresponding edge. Okay. Um, then the conjecture says that P prime has to be flat. Okay. Um, it's apparently unknown, and even the case that you, for instance, I, I don't, I, I think you can even um, assume that each phase of P prime is the plateau solution of its boundary. It's still unknown. So um, it's, this is called a dihedral rigidity conjecture. <coughs> so what's the scalar curvature? Right, scalar curvature is right. The, the point is that um, now we're in Euclidean space, right? Oh. So the scalar curvature is just zero, right? It's just flat in the interior. So um, in general, you can uh, you can formulate this question in spaces with non-negative scalar curvature, right? OK, so that's what he quotes somewhere else. But um, I, you know, I, I think he, he claimed it's, a, it's an open question. Uh, yeah, Gormov had a construction in the paper. Yeah. It's not rigorous once again, but I, I, I think it, it, it can be, you know, it, it should work. Right. OK, so um, uh, I'm going to describe a solution to uh, this conjecture in, in some cases. So um, OK, so let's uh, consider um, two type of polyhedron. The first is that, OK, so um, um, maybe I, I should write the title to this to this part. Um, let's just call it dihedral rigidity. All right. So um, the um, let, let's consider um, in R three two types of um, two types of uh, flat polyhedron. The first is that uh, well, the first type I call them a cone. So uh, what you do is that you take a planar polygon and a point outside, and you connect everything in between. Okay, and then the second type, let's uh, let me call it a prism. Um, in this case, you take a um, you take two parallel and uh, similar polygon on two parallel planes. So they are congruent up to scaling, but not up to rotation. So let's connect everything in between. All right, there, there are some notations. So uh, I'm going to call, um, for a call, I'm going to call this point the vertex. Um, and its opposite face, I'm, I'm going to call it B. It's a base, base face. And uh, all the other faces, I'm going to call them side faces and denote it by FJ. So, um, well, let's denote it by prime because I'm going to use the same notation for the you know Ramanian manifold. All right. So uh, let me first state the theorem. Um, let P be a Euclidean um, flat cone. War prism. Um, let's denote uh, side faces of P by um, this F1 prime, FK prime, and the base phase equals to B. 
OK, and uh, I need this uh, angles gamma j to be the, let the angles to be the angle between fj prime and b. Um, OK, let, let me use b prime. So I'm going to call this angles gamma j. OK, so um, this is, we fix such one such um, polyhedron, which is the comparison object. And uh, we consider a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold, be um, Lipschitz diffeomorphic to P. Um, by that, I, I, you know, I actually mean a little bit more than Lipschitz diffeomorphic. I want faces maps to faces, interior maps to interior. Right? So it's uh, combinatorially they, they look the same. Um, okay, and uh, denote. Uh, side faces of M by um, F1 to FJ. FK. All right, let, uh, let's keep one picture in mind. So um, this is a curved simplex M, and these are FJs, and we're comparing it to a Euclidean simplex P. This is M and this is P. All right, we, um, I'm going to need this condition on the angles. So pi minus gamma j plus gamma j plus 1. Remember, gammas are from the Euclidean model. It's less than, everywhere less than the dihedral angle along M of Fj and Fj prime plus 1. So. Um, Right, so, um, so you, you basically compare the, the, the angle along this edge to this constant angle, right? and along this edge to this constant angle, and so, and so, on. And, so on. and I, I require this um, extra condition. It's uh, okay. Um, so that's everywhere on um, Fj intersecting Fj plus one. Um, then you cannot have, uh, you, you should have strict comparison, namely um, Rg uh, is non negative in the interior, and the faces are weakly mean convex. Mean convex. And everywhere dihedral angle. Let's say strictly less than the di corresponding dihedral angle along P. Okay, this cannot happen. All right, so let's first verify this condition for cubes. Then, okay, so cube uh, belongs to the family of prisms, right? So um, then uh, these gamma j's are everywhere pi over two. Therefore, this condition is uh, vacuous, right? It's aut automatic because you have zero on, on, on this side. All right, so um, and, uh, if, um, if in addition, this gamma j is the base angles of the, um, the uh, Euclidean model are all less than or equal than pi over two, then we have a rigidity. Um, namely, um, namely, these um, these three conditions. will imply that M is flat. Let's say it's isometric to a flat. So, in particular, for the cube question, um, we we know a complete answer. Um, okay, so let me uh, try to uh, try to give you a proof. Excuse me for the last rigidity. Do you mean that the, the part inside this? Oh, I just keep moving. 
the, the, the rigidity uh, means inside is flat. Each face is a flat planar face. And, and each face is flat planar face, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's try to. Uh, Can I say again, where is the angle IG? Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. This notation just mean a, an arbitrary dihedral angle. Between uh, I Yeah, so, right, so, so it's between um, FJ and FJ plus one, or between FJ and the base, right? So I, I really need to uh, assume everywhere it's true, not not just uh, you know between these faces. So I, I mean, you use I and J. Uh, uh, let, let, okay, let, 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 let me just erase I and J then. It's just everywhere. You, you, when you have a dihedral angle, you 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 have this. Okay, so. Um, The proof goes by, OK, let me uh, try to convince you on the proof of uh, a, a, a simple colon. It's a simplex. So this is m. And uh, let's use some notations. This is the vertex p, and uh, this is fj, and this is p. OK, so we're going to consider this. Uh, Quantity, which is the infimum of um, the two dimensional Hausdorff measure of um, an open set E intersecting the interior of M minus J from 1 to K of cosine gamma J uh, times the two dimensional Hausdorff measure of boundary E intersecting FJ. Okay, and we're taking the infimum for O E, which is an open set uh, that um, P is contained in E, and E does not intersect B. Okay, so um, let, let's let's give this a function of a name and create F of E. Um, all right, so um, why do we care about this functional? Well, because it's a first variation. Um, um, uh, well, because it's minimizer in, in the Euclidean say, space. OK, so let's take the Euclidean cube. So, sorry, Euclidean simplex. And uh, remember, gamma j's are just these angles. Okay, and we're uh, minimizing among all this uh, open set E, um, the boundary of open set E uh, intersecting M interior, so this is an area of this surface, minus the um, weighted area of E on the boundary, okay. uh, uh, on the FJs. Okay, so um, we can write down the first variation of this um, function. Um, okay, let's um, okay. Let 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 sigma be um, boundary E intersecting M interior. Okay, so we're particularly interested in the separating surface sigma. Um, then um, this first variation is um, okay. So the first term is the interior area. So a minus h times uh, let's call the uh, let's call the function f. Uh, f is the normal part of uh, Um, of the variation, and plus integrating on sigma uh, on, on the boundary part, where you have different boundary parts. And if you calculate this um, first variation of this function, <coughs> well then it's going to be, hmm, OK, let's call this vector field y. Then um, y 
times nu minus cosine gamma j nu bar. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to draw a few pictures um, where this notation is um, in the following thing. So imagine near a boundary, you have a surface. This is sigma, and this is n. Okay, so this is gamma. Well, all right, we, we don't know it's gamma yet, but let's call this co-normal of boundary of sigma inside, let's, uh, let's call it mu, and co-normal of boundary sigma inside boundary m, nu bar. All right, so that, that's the notation I'm going to use. Okay, so in particular, if you, if you um, let first variation to be zero, then um, critical point of, um, of f, the functional f, um, it's equivalent to say that h in, is zero in the interior, and on the boundary, nu equals to cosine gamma j, oh, sorry, nu. Um, this vector um, paired with any uh, admissible vector transformation y, 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 y is just tangential, right? So this is um, normal to boundary m. Okay. Um, and, and this translates to the fact that um, sigma is minimal, and uh, sigma meets the uh, phase fj at constant angle gamma j. All right. So, um, so in the Euclidean case, um, you should believe. Well, it is reasonable to believe that the minimizer of this functional is um, this parallel planes intersecting them. Right? It's the planes parallel to the base intersecting this um, uh, this uh, simplex. In which is non trivial. Right, so right. For for the Euclidean case or I mean the infimum is zero, it's not positive for the okay. So if you right, if you take sigma to be the base base plane, then, then you get zero. But you can also take an empty set. You can take the empty set. I'm saying that there are you know a family of minimizers in the Euclidean case. So how do you know you have a non trivial minimizer? In, in general? In general, that's because you can take the you know take the tangent call and the p. Well, it's basically because the uh, dihedral angles along p is too small. Then you know it's a local, local argument. Okay, okay. that's a good point. All right. So um, all right. So um, let's keep in mind of this uh, functional on the theorem over there. So let me uh, so in general, such surfaces are called um, so um, sigma is called um, capillary um, in in this case capillary and the minimal surface. Okay, so it's uh, it's uh, like a generalization of free boundary minimal surface. All right, so we're going to uh, prove that uh, this this functional i. In, if you if we assume the strict um, comparison, then this fu um, th th this uh, infimum i is achieved by a uh, regular capillary minimal surface. So the first part is to show the ex existence and regularity. Okay, so the first observation is a maximum principle. Uh, because we require that B is mean convex, right? Weakly mean convex. Therefore, the interior of this, um, um, well, where it's a, uh, um, okay, so let me, let me write that down. So um, by a theorem of uh, Brian, Brian White and the Solomon, the um, minimizer do not intersect, let's say touch B 
be unless uh, it's completely contained in B. Right. This is because the interior term is just the area, right? and B is mean convex. And uh, the, uh, the boundary, uh, we assume that everywhere along these boundaries, the dihedral angle is uh, strictly less than gamma j. Right? So then uh, we actually have this boundary maximum principle. Um, which means, which says that the, the, um, the minimizer uh, support does not contain any, any point on the boundary. Okay, so these are just based on first variation. Okay, then we can um, um, use the theorem of uh, Gene Taylor. So um, Taylor has a very general theorem of such functionals minimizer existence of minimizer. Okay, so um, he, well, she, um, she proved that uh, the, the existence of a minimizer um, E and moreover sigma let's denote it by sigma interior um, is smooth um, and smooth in the interior and uh, has smooth boundary uh, where, where the ambient manifold boundary is smooth. OK, so that means away from, this, um, away from this edges, these edges, these edges, sigma is actually smooth. Okay, and um, this theorem is strict, strictly for the minimizer. All right. So then, the um, the regularity part of, of the of this um, proof is the question when the, um, the the when sigma is actually smooth at the corner, right? We we, we need some sort of uh, regularity at the corner to carry out the rest of the analysis. Um, okay. So the theorem is um, sigma. Okay. When let's see. Um, we have this um, star condition over there. This is only used for, for this part of the argument. So um, when star holds, sigma has um, holder continuous. Union normal at the corner, at the corner. Okay. Let me try to convince you that this is indeed a fact. Um, so star is a condition which guarantees the existence of a tangent plane at a corner. Because um, it's a linear algebra exercise, if you take a wedge in, in R3 um, prescribing there um, and, and, and with an opening angle, let's call that uh, um, theta. If you want a third plane intersecting these two planes, um, at angle gamma 1 and gamma 2, then there's a relation between gamma 1, gamma 2, and theta. Okay, so you, you can't, you know, you can't make a picture for arbitrary choices of uh, gamma 1, gamma 1, and theta, and the conditions are precisely start. So pi minus um, gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Well, actually, there, there's an upper bound as well. OK, so this is the condition for the existence of a tangent plane, basically. OK? Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I'm still confused on the function. Do you mean h1 of the No, no, h2. I, I, I mean, I mean um, the area of this part, these phases. 
I'm not. Oh, okay. So you are yeah. picking the relative boundary. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, um, but. Uh, okay. So. So then. Um, yeah. We we are, uh, we were talking about you know uh, the meaning of this condition star is a necessary condition for the existence of tangent plane. Okay. Do, you see, do you see the solution never touches the base? So this gamma i and gamma g only happens uh, along the boundary of b. Uh, okay, so they, they are constant. So so the the statement of the yeah, let me be more clear. So we're fixing this p over there, right? Yeah. So gamma gamma i and gamma j are just constants. Yeah. Independent of m. Yeah, but it's somehow it's the angle is uh, base p in your model. Right. Yeah. So you below uh, you. Can you still see the base? If you don't see the base, where are sub i, gamma j? The inside is n. Yeah, they are here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so why is the solution not trivial? Oh, yeah, that, that, that's related to the question why i is ne strictly negative, right? right? Because w w we, when you take the tangent cone at p, we assume that th at, th at this point, the dihedral angles are s strictly smaller than the corresponding picture. Then, then it's you know, we, we can guarantee that i is small, smaller than zero. Negative. So, so in the rigidity case, uh, I need to deal with the um, situation where i is zero. Then that's a different proof. All right. So um, let me uh, let me just mention this part of the argument is um, very similar to a paper by Leon Simon. Um, I think the paper is in. 79 or something um, about capillary surfaces and you know s solutions of capillary <coughs> equations or so. Um, it involves, um, let me um, write down a few steps. So it involves a um, coerced lower density bound. Um, at the corner. And then um, one need to argue that the um, um, so t it's, a, it's, a, it's a tangent cone analysis, tangent cone. So once you know there is a non-trivial lower density bound um, and, the, and there's a natural monotonic density formula, you can um, take the tangent cone, and the tangent cone is actually planar and the unique in, in dimension 2. Okay, you have unique um, planar tangent cone, then um, unfortunately, we don't have an, any other type theory now, but um, in dimension two, we can, you know, we can further prove that the surface is graphical. And there are some classical PD results will say that the graph function is actually C1 alpha. Okay, it, it, would, be, it would be nice to um, to have an other type theory, and then um, you know this this process can be. You know, simplified a lot. All right. So um, um, then, um, let's see. I have five more minutes. So let me write down a formula and uh, conclude the proof of the non-rigid statement. So if the geometric condition holds, then we know the existence of this separating surface sigma. But on the other hand, if we just look at the second variation formula of the functional, um, then one could um, get this variation. So the first part is still the interior area part. And the second part is a um, boundary part. Let's call it Q F square, where Q um, is equal to this D F D nu. Uh, sorry, let me write it as uh, oh, okay. Let me just write D F D nu minus um, okay. it should be D F D nu minus Q F times f. Okay. So and, and q is um, 1 over psi gamma j 
on time to the second fundamental form acting on nu nu, that's cotangent gamma j times a nu nu, where the second fundamental form is the, this notation here means the second fundamental form of Bunkery m in m. Okay, so then I claim if everywhere the dihedral angle along these parts, fi, fj, and fj plus 1, are strictly less than the, um, those dihedral angle on the Euclidean model, then the function 1 um, well, let, let me write it as uh, down square f um, hitting on the constant function 1 would be negative. Okay. And it involves some ghost Bonnet argument, and uh, you know. Okay, so um, this is a contradiction because it's a global minimizer. And let me just very bri briefly mention how do we do the rigidity case, um, where so so this kind of rigidity question um, is a generalization of the you know free boundary minimal error minimizing surface it's a rigidity type question. Um, so and Lucas has done that uh, very well. So I, I just look, read his paper, right, and um, learned a lot of arguments. So it, it turns out those sort of arguments also works here. In a case when i is non-zero, right, strictly less than zero, or you have a separating surface sigma, right. So it's a um, CMC foliation argument. If i is zero and you don't necessarily have sigma anymore, but in that case. Um, um, in that case, I'll, I need to do more things, which actually is a local foliation result. So if i is 0, then it means the, um, at, at point p, the dihedral angles are exactly equal to the Euclidean space. Then um, there exists a local um, CMC capillary. <coughs> foliation um, near um, in, in an of p of the vertex p. And uh, um, furthermore, I guarantee, and it, one can guarantee that uh, foliation, let's call that sigma rho. Um, first is that h, the mean curvature of sigma rho approaches 0. And uh, um, sigma rho um, meets the um, fj at constant gamma, constant angle gamma j. Okay, so it's a purely local result. And then with this foliation, one can carry out the Brandon Bray, Bray, Bray Brandon Nevis argument. And argue that this foliation is actually a flat foliation, therefore. Um, it, it, it extends to a global foliation. All right, then l let me just add one more comment. Um, namely, um, I think the um, similar treatment for this type of rigidity question um, by, by friends um, Al Alessandra and Otis and Eichmere's argument should also work in this case. Um, that, that, that's my, my guess, I think. All right, so let me uh, stop here, maybe.